My investigation takes me to the legendary Coney Island, where 14-year-old Shade Falavita examines whether this giant pair of lion's paws once stood guard over the entrance to a famed amusement park. Our first story takes us in pursuit of some very big game, hunting for evidence that these lion's paws once hung over the entrance to a famed amusement park. Coney Island, New York. At the dawn of the 20th century, this strip of land in South Brooklyn beckons to a nation struggling out of an economic depression. It promises a cocktail of fun and fantasy for the broiling masses of New York City. With its unprecedented mixing of social classes and sexes and its use of technology to create fantastic carnival rides, Coney Island redefines how Americans entertain themselves. At the heart of it all is Steeplechase Park with its signature mechanical horse race. Some 70 years later, the ride ends and Steeplechase shuts its doors. Almost nothing remains of that early magic. Now a New York City collector thinks he's found an artifact from those long lost days when Coney Island captivated the world. Coney Island has always had a magic for me. When I hold these paws, I think of a lion that must be as big as a two-story building, something that just wants to gobble you up. I'm Gwendolyn Wright. I'm teaming up for this investigation with a student filmmaker from Brooklyn, Shade Falavita. Shade? Hi, Gwen. How are you? I'm good. Nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. I'm looking forward to this. Ready to go? Yes. Is it okay if I bring my camera? It's a good idea. Okay. Let's get started. Hi, Jim. I'm Gwen. Hi, We're meeting Jim at his home in Pelham, New York. Oh, there they are. Oh, wow. They're enormous and pretty ferocious. So, Jim, what's the story behind these? Uh, the story is that they were part of larger lions that were over the entrance to Steeplechase Park in Coney Island. They hung out over the entrance, ready to leap on anyone who came <laughs> in, huh? How did you get them? I bought them from the estate of Frederick Fried, who was the man who dismantled Steeplechase Park in the 1960s. What made you want to find out about them now? Well, you know, I spent a lot of time at Coney Island when I was a child. I'd like to have solid proof that these actually existed at the entrance to Steeplechase Park. Well, I've always wanted to do a story about Coney Island. It transformed the nature of public entertainment. And back then, it wasn't for kids. It was for women and men of all classes. Oh, that's true. So don't worry. We'll find out where your paws came from. That would be great. What made you be interested in wanting to be a junior detective on a story about Coney Island? I mean, I live in Brooklyn, so Coney Island is like my home. <laughs> it's right around the corner, so to find out more about it is interesting. You like then probing and asking questions about things, too, I can tell already. <laughs> I'm glad to have Sade's help. If we do have part of a lion that guarded the entrance to Steeplechase Park, it's a potent symbol of a long vanished age, when the new century and the promise of technology offered the public a fantastical escape from the world of the ordinary. Coney Island's brightest light was George C. Tilliou, the owner of Steeplechase Park. He'd made money as a kid by selling authentic Coney Island sand to tourists. Tilliou realized that whatever their social class, many people love to be on stage. And he capitalized on making visitors part of the show. He also helped unlace the corset of Victorian sexual repression. At Steeplechase, strangers flirted with abandon and were jostled together on rides such as the Barrel of Love and the Human Roulette Wheel. Although critics brand Coney Island Sodom by the Sea, its popularity grows. In the early 1900s, Luna and Dreamland Parks joined Steeplechase, adding glamour with elegant architecture and dramatic lights. At its height in the 1920s, a million people a day visit the several Coney Island amusement parks. 
Our first step is to find out when these paws were made. That will tell us if they could have been at Steeplechase Park. We're consulting with Gwen's colleague, Dr. Richard Piper, at Columbia University School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. So Piper, what do you think? Well, they're big, and they're surprisingly light, Not given that, that they're metal objects. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think they're made of? Well, I'd like you to test them and tell us exactly what they are made of. Why don't we use this X-ray fluorescence gun that's a, a way of doing elemental analysis and identifying the metal. Hold it right against the surface here and press this trigger right here and the results will come up on this screen. See that? See the ZN right there mm -hmm. on the screen? That stands for zinc. These are made out of stamped zinc mm -hmm. and these pieces of stamped zinc have been pressed in dies to form a particular shape and then they cut out the individual smaller pieces and they solder them together. And during what time period do you think they would have used zinc? Let's say 1875 to 1925 is a good date. Those dates are the right time period. The paws could have been at Coney Island. But Piper also tells us that zinc breaks easily when stressed and doesn't react well to temperature changes. I live in Brooklyn. Coney Island is freezing in winter and very hot in the summer. It seems that zinc would be a poor choice for a sculpture. The other issue with zinc is that it dissolves easily in acid rain. Knowing the disadvantages of zinc, why do you think somebody would use it? It was very cheap, and it was very malleable, so it was great for architectural ornament. At the turn of the century, zinc was often used for architectural ornamentation. And there's another clue that our paws were part of the sculpture. They were clearly designed to fit into something else, a lion's body, perhaps. These mounting stubs were meant to slip into sockets so that these pieces could be mounted onto a larger piece, and that this piece was intended to be either disassembled either seasonally or periodically at least, and that's very unusual for architectural ornament. Well, we've gotten a lot of important information. Thanks very much. Thank you, Gwen. My pleasure. Thank you for helping us with our investigation. Thanks, Shelly. Good luck on your search. Thank you. Yeah, these, you're talking about these things being very light. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So the dating and materials for the paws check out. Shade and I need to find out what happened to steeplechase artifacts when the park shut down in the 1960s. We head back to the boardwalk to meet historian Richard Snow. Hey, Richard. Hi. Hi, good to see you. Good to see you. This is Shade. This is Hi Richard. there. How are you Richard? doing? Well, Richard, you are the person to help us with this really intriguing question. Now, we've seen these glorious pictures of steeplechase at its height, magnificent buildings and glorious statues. What happened? Well, remember, it did run for 70 years. That's not bad for an elaborate show, but the world changed. After World War II, America moved to the suburbs, Disneyland is born, and uh, everything from automobiles to movies are interesting people more than Steeplechase Park, and it basically was out of date. Is there any specific reason why Steeplechase shut down? I would